Good evening. Good evening. I, Lasagna Flowers Ivory, Vice President of the Duncanville ISD Board of Trustees, call this meeting of the Duncanville Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of Board of Trustees is present, that the meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, <coughs> Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Our mission at Duncanville ISD is to engage, equip, and empower all scholars to achieve their unique potential. We will now move to opening ceremonies. Trustee Vera Cruz will open us in a word of prayer. Thank you. Please join me. Lord, we commit this evening's meeting to you. Give us clear minds and peaceful hearts and decisions that are being made tonight. Give us insight to lead with integrity that our decisions may reflect what is right and good. We pray for overflow of fresh vision and new levels of wisdom for students and educators, leaders and staff on their return from spring break. We pray for favor and protection over all students, educators, campuses, and all classrooms set for overflow for a desire to learn. Glory is yours forever and amen. Amen. Please stand with us for the pledges. We will now move on to the superintendent's report. I will now turn the meeting over to Superintendent Andrea Fields. Well, good evening. Good evening, Madam Vice President, board members, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, tonight, uh, it's my pleasure to present the superintendent's report. It's been a very busy few weeks in Duncanville ISD since our last report in February. We continue to write success stories one student at a time, and yes, our story continues. First, we want to thank all for making the My Future, My Choice showcase a huge success. This year, the showcase featured a Western theme. We had over 600 families attend. The Advanced Academics and Innovation Team challenged each campus to garner the most participants. After carefully tallying the signatures, Central Elementary School was the winning campus with the most attendees. Congratulations and a big yee-haw to <laughs> Principal Parker and the team. Thank you, Ms. Thomas and team, for planning a great way to showcase all that Duncanville ISD has to offer. Next slide. Skills USA is the number one workforce development organization for students, and its primary goal is to empower students to become skilled professionals, career-ready leaders, and responsible community members. We were unstoppable at this year's competition, or as the 2024 theme stated, there were no limits for our student success. For our high school and middle school students walked away with bronze, silver, and gold medals from culinary arts, advertising, welding, photography, and auto repair. Kudos to our teachers and leaders for their continued support of our students. Congratulations to our Skills USA students, yes. participants. <laughs> Next slide. There's still more good news. Congratulations 
to our Duncanville ISD communications team for winning 18, I said 18, 18 awards at the, <clears throat> excuse me, 2024 annual Texas School Public Relations Conference in February. First, they won first best of category, won um, award, 10 gold star awards, and seven silver star awards. A special thank you and a shout out to multimedia specialist Hillary Hobson for her video, The State Championship Football. That video won top honors in the video category from all, all entries from across the state. Congratulations, Hillary. Yes, she's in the back back there, wait. Miss Hillary, wave your wave hand. Wave your hand, Hillary. <laughs> the team earned six awards last year, 18 awards this year, and they've already set their sights on more submissions for next year, anticipating they will win even more uh, as a part of this really robust and competitive competition with the Texas School Public Relations Association. And congratulations again to the team. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Next slide. Texas Thespians is pleased to recognize theater students who demonstrate high academic success in overall coursework through the Texas Theater Scholarship Distinction. Monette Whitlock, what has received the Texas Theater Scholar Award for the 2023-2024 school year. Her academic and theatrical work met or exceeded the requirements for this award. To be designated as a Texas Theater Scholar, a student must, one, actively participate in theatrical programs during the school year, earn a minimum cumulative GPA of 3.0 or 4.0 scale for academic coursework and exhibit behavior and good moral character, which brings honor to the campus theater department, the school and community. Congratulations, Monette, for your exemplary performance on and off stage. We're delighted that you continue to promote excellence in the theater education and that you are part of the Texas Thespian family. So congratulations to Monette to, on that great honor. I don't, believe, I don't believe she's here tonight. All right. But we want to congratulate her. Next slide. Is she here? Him? Oh, I am so sorry. I apologize for that. I didn't have a picture, so I, I apologize. Him, thank you all. His students know I apologize, all right? All right. In line with our strategic plan for student academic success and having our scholars future ready, I'm pleased to announce several Duncanville High School students traveled to the state competition for the Texas Association of Future Teachers, fondly known as TAFI. Congratulations are in order again for two of our outstanding students. Grayson Peterman advanced to the national competition in Washington, D.C. in the category of lesson planning and delivery. We're also celebrating Destiny Keaton, who was awarded a scholarship to the University of North Texas. Their commitment and dedication to their program of study has prepared them for post-secondary opportunities in the field of education, and we are Panther proud. And we hope Grayson and Destiny will return one day to join the Duncanville ISD teaching staff. Congratulations to these future educators. Yes. <laughs> In just a moment, we will formally recognize the Pantherettes for bringing the state championship title back to Duncanville. This victory is a true testament to your hard work, dedication, and teamwork. When you are talented, have great leadership, and work hard to get better every day, you are in a position to be victorious. We applaud each of you, your parents, and the coaching staff, and as I stated, the night of the victory in San Antonio, Texas, the Pantherettes, 
brought the championship back to where it rightfully belongs, and that's Duncanville, the city of champions. Congratulations to the Panthers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes my report. Can we go back to that first? You want to go back? Yes. You want to go back? And I have something about that, too. I wasn't really sure. I do have the opening picture there. I was going to say finally. I wasn't sure if it was at the end or not. Finally, we want to congratulate our board president, Mr. Coach Phil McNeely, and the 1999 state championship boys basketball team for being recognized in San Antonio the weekend of March 8th through 9th. We're grateful to Coach, even though he's not here, and all the former players for the legacy of championships that they brought for our boys basketball program and for Duncanville in general. So congratulations to Coach Phil McNeely, even in his absence. And we're so proud of him and the 1990 state championship team. So congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Ivory. Thank you, Ms. Fields. We will now move to recognitions. I will turn the meeting over to Ms. Wallace. Good evening, Vice President I Dr. Ivory, the Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent Mrs. Fields. Um, what we have here on the screen are our donations that we've um, recently received. And as you can see, we have $9,100 in cash donations and over $7,600 in supply donations. Are there any questions about what we have received? If you'll take special note, I did notice, and it could be others in the audience, but I did notice that um, our the president of our Duncanville ISD Education Foundation, uh, President Dr. Miner, is here in the building, and they recently made a $7,500 donation to our district libraries, and I think that is worth us just pulling that out and acknowledging them for their continued support and contributions to Duncanville ISD. Thank you, Dr. Miner. All right, I think I, am I okay to move forward? All right, so next we have the, an opportunity to um, celebrate our Made with Pride in Duncanville. Each month we honor a student, staff member, and teacher who goes above and beyond. They are chosen from nominations submitted by coworkers, classmates, or community members. And these individuals reflect the excellence and pride of our district, and they are Made with Pride in Duncanville. At this time, I would like to ask Mr. Washington, will you please join me at the podium? All right, Mr. Washington, I'm finally going to let you keep this this time. Okay. So Mr. Washington comes highly recommended by his peers and supervisors, past and present. And they wanted to let everybody know that Mr. Sean Washington, he is a technology technician who is very instrumental in aiding campuses with a plethora of technology needs. He greets teachers and campus staff with a smile, and he's always ready to assist and ease their worries. Everybody isn't into technology like you might be. He has a unique way of empowering teachers to integrate technology into their lesson plans and create engaging lessons for the students. Mr. Washington goes the extra mile and is very patient the team of educators that, miss, that you work with, they have said on many occasions that you truly represent the district's core values, and for those reasons, you are made with pride in Duncanville. 
Thank you. Does Mr. Washington, do you have any family, friends, colleagues here? Will you guys please stand and be recognized? All right, thank you. Uh, yes, and he has a host of friends in the, in the tech room back in the back. <laughs> thank you. And next, I'd like to invite Ms. Babels, will you please join me at the podium? We practiced her name. I did good, didn't I? Here is your certificate. We are super proud of you. So this is Miss Denise Babels, everyone, and she is a counselor at Bill Hartz Elementary School. But before her current position, she was a fourth grade teacher at Acton Elementary uh, during the 22-23 school year. And when former Acton colleague uh, Tashia Lindsay first met you, she said that you were the first person to greet her with a warm and sweet smile. And she really appreciated that about you. And that you took her on as a mentee, even though you were juggling completing a master's degree and all that comes with being a mom of a high school daughter. She said that you stand out because you were so helpful with lesson plans and grade book concerns, and you would even stay late to give her assistance. Tashia said, the most stressful of situations don't ruffle your feathers. She says that instead you, can, you have a cool and calm temperament uh, and that you can cool the temperature of any room and calm the staff with just your presence. That's powerful. So those uh, that you have helped have been paying it forward, and she wanted you to know that she's seen that teachers that you helped along the way, they are turning that right around, and they are being eager and helping new teachers as well. They're giving to others because you modeled the way. And for these reasons, you are made with pride in Duncanville. Congratulations, Ms. Davis. Does Ms. Sables, do you have family and or friends here with you celebrating? If you guys will stand and be recognized. All right, congratulations. <laughs> and certainly not least, certainly last but not least, we have Miss Destiny. Brian, Destiny, where are you? Come on down. So this is Miss Destiny Bryant, and she is a seventh grader at Kennemer Middle School, and she has attended Duncanville ISD since the first grade. Look at you. Um, over her time as a student in the district, Destiny has joined multiple clubs and has been awarded for her many achievements throughout the years. Destiny is in the STEAM program at Kennemer, a member of the symphonic band, Coming. and a member of the cheerleading squad. Uh, th this Kinnemer student excels in extracurricular activities, but also has her academics on lock. She has built genuine relationships with her peers, teachers, and staff in Duncanville ISD. And for these reasons, you are made with pride in Duncanville. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Will the parents, family, friends, if you guys will stand and be recognized, all right, let's give them a round of applause. At this time, I'd like to invite you guys to take a, um, a look at the video that showcases our three honorees a little bit closer. 
It's the following student, staff member, and teacher who are made with pride in Duncanville. Hello, I'm Denise Babels. I'm the school counselor at Bill Hartz Elementary. Uh, as school counselor, I work closely with students to help with their academic and social emotional needs, as well as any resources that they need for their family. I also um, do classroom guidance lessons, so definitely being able to interact with them each day is what I enjoy most. Just being able to impact my community um, in that way and benefit my uh, hometown in that way is what really encouraged me to become a counselor and letting um, our people know that it doesn't have to be stigmatized that mental health is actually your physical health as well. Hi, I'm Destiny Bryant. I'm a seventh grader at Kenny Member to School. I'm a part of the STEAM Academy. I do cheer, I play volleyball, and I'm in theater. When I grow up, I want to be a cosmetologist because I like to do hair and nails. What I think it takes to be a good student is to be respectful and have good listening skills because you should always respect your peers and your teachers. And when you listen, you get more information and it will help you have your academic stuff up. Hi, my name is Sean Washington. I'm a campus technician in the technology department. I have four schools that I go to, and we work on making sure that the teachers, the students, the staff members there are taken care of as far as their devices. I think the favorite part of my job is being able to assist the, the staff members, the teachers, the students, and seeing the smiles on their faces. I enjoy helping people. I've always enjoyed helping people. And so being able to do it from a technology aspect and seeing how when you fix something, their, their faces just light up. They say thank you. They're grateful. So that I think that really makes my day. Um, it, it's just a great atmosphere to be in. I'm around great employees, uh, around great teachers. So it's, it's definitely great to be here. These honorees truly are made with pride in Duncanville. At this time, may I have our honorees, our May with Pride honorees, uh, Mrs. Fields and Dr. Ivory, if you guys will join us for a photograph at Hillary's direction and Jeff. And we still have more celebrations. At this time, I would like to congratulate um, eight amazing students that are listed here. Um, we are honoring, recognizing them for their accomplishments in band and in choir. Mr. Till and Miss Smith, um, if you are here, um, yes, I know you're here because I've talked to you tonight. Come on down, I'm gonna get you to help me out. <laughs> the right one gets to the and these are for those students. I want to read a little bit about the students. So these students that you see their name placed here, these students performed uh, with the Texas All-State Ensembles in San Antonio um, on Saturday, February the 10th. Um, and these students are what we call all state. This is the highest honor a Texas music student can receive. These musicians were chosen for, the, for this prestigious honor through a competitive process held this year across the state at district, 
region, and area levels. Mr. Till is the director of bands, and Ms. Smith is the director of choirs, um, and they are both members of the Texas Music Ed Music Educators Association. So at this time, I'd like to invite those students to come on up, our four choir students, uh, Zion, Abriana, Lyric, Jeffrey, come on down. And if we can have our band students um, to come on down. Uh, Davarion, Henri, Noah, and Mark. You can go ahead and bring them to the Thank you. So we just want to let you guys know that we are extremely proud of all that you have accomplished this school year. And it is also important to note that Mr. Barry, this is Mr. Barry, raise your hand. Wave so everybody can see you. So he is among an esteemed group um, that are being recognized this year. But Mr. Barry, this is your fourth time to be recognized for this honor. Is that correct? And this is historical because Jeffrey Barry is Duncan Velayesti's first four-year All-State musician. Congratulations. So if I could have Dr. Ivory and Mrs. Fields to come down and take a photograph with them. And if I can have our directors to join them and Mr. Doucet. And I hear it's Miss Smith Gibson now. Okay, last Sunday. Congratulations. All right. And now for our, my final presentation. Um, our basketball. So the Duncanville High School girls basketball team, they were laser focused on bringing the state's top title home to the city of champions. The powerhouse Pantherettes, they faced Umble Summer, Umble Summer Creek on March 1st and took on South Green Prairie on March 2nd to clinch the 2020. 2024 UIL 6A state champion title. So Duncanville High School's girls basketball program, they have an extensive legacy of success and prominence. This was their 27th appearance at the state competition and their 12th state championship win. So Coach Ford, please join me at the podium. All right. So head girls basketball coach Neiman Ford um, has 20 years, is it 20 years or over 20 years? 
Nobody counted. Okay, he said we'll go with 20. He has 20 years of coaching experience with this as his first time ever at the helm of a girls basketball team? First time head coach. Head coach for? And first time girls professional coach. Look at you, go head on. And to get to do all that leading the Pantherettes, amazing, congratulations. So I know that um, you're over the moon about the win, but I'd like for you to take a brief moment to share with the board, our school community, um, and our school community, a few highlights from this season and what you're most proud of. Take a few moments. Good evening. Um, I want to thank everyone for having us here. It was a great opportunity to, and to be honored here, and we appreciate everything. I want to thank the board. Uh, without you guys, we don't have the opportunity to go play the schedule we play. So I appreciate y'all giving us those opportunities and uh, providing us with those assets and resources. Uh, I want to thank the parents and the, the players. Without them, none of this is possible. I want to thank my coaching staff. Uh, they do an excellent job of preparing us day in and day out for what we have ahead of the, um, <clears throat> for the task ahead. Um, this year's highlights, um, this team was really special for obvious reasons, uh, but the girls showed a level of resilience a uh, level of Duncanville pride, um, um, a championship mentality, a will to win um, that I've never seen in a team before. Um, and we did it without a girl over 5'10". Every game we was undersized, uh, but uh, it's not the size of the fight in the dog, but the, the size of the fight in the dog. Dog in the fight. Um, so they, they, they did an excellent job. Uh, this year, uh, we won the, the Sandra Meadows Classic, uh, hosted by uh, uh, Mr. Steve Martin. Great, one of the best tournaments in the uh, country. Uh, we beat uh, a couple state champions from other states along the way. Um, we also um, was co-district champs, uh, regional champs, and also we went on to win the state championship uh, with the uh, state MVP, uh, Mariah. And, um, <laughs> She, she, she did an excellent job. She was one of, I only had two seniors, uh, Mariah Clayton and Chloe Mann. They did a great job leading us the whole year. Uh, without those young ladies' uh, leadership, perseverance, uh, we couldn't have been here today. So we really appreciate them. And once again, I thank you all for the opportunity y'all give us. The week of the championship game, we hosted a press conference, and I believe we had almost every major out, uh, media outlet there um, to cover this phenomenal team. And when I got a chance um, to watch the footage back and some of the broadcast, I don't know if it was Chloe or if it was Mariah, but one of them talked about the banners that are hanging at Sandra Meadows and how they wanted to bring one home. And so so to commemorate this um, wonderful victory, we would like for um, each of your players to take home some, a banner for them to place at home so they can always remember that they are the home of the state champions. So if I can have our team and coaches to please come on down. Everybody come up, please. Go ahead and come on down, and then we're going to invite our um, Dr. Ivory and Miss Phils. Please come on down and join this photograph. While they're getting ready, I'd like to say that I, um, too, am a graduate of Duncanville High School and it was on the Duncanville Pantherettes many moons ago. So I want you to think about after you, uh, after you go out into the world and do your thing, think about coming back to Duncanville and serving on the school board. Because I, I believe I'm the first, so we need another one to follow up. Please let me let, know I was in choir. And I was also in the band, not very good in band, but I was in choir too.
Also, before I forget, um, we finished top 10 in the country, so congratulations to the ladies. Um, we, were, we, we, uh, we were not ranked in the nation going into it, so for us to go from unranked to top 10 is really impressive in the work that they put in. And um, like I, I tell people all the time, that doesn't happen without you guys by signing off, allowing us to go play out of state, play all these different teams, and we appreciate y'all. We really do. And let's take a look at our video. Duncanville High School Pantherettes on winning that 12th state championship. I feel so, so great today. I feel amazing for the girls. A job well done. We battled through adversity. And we're coming home again to the City of Champions as state champions. The energy in the room, the excitement by the fans, the play by our Pantherettes, amazing. What a wonderful ending to this championship weekend. We're bringing it back home again to the City of Champions. Congratulations to our Pantherettes. Way to go, D. Uh, coaching staff did an amazing job. They've had them prepared all year long. Uh, they showed a lot of perseverance, made great adjustments at key moments of the game. And most importantly, they made sure that the kids made the free throws down the stretch. It means a lot. I feel very grateful. Man and team, we finally did it. We told ourselves one more. We know that if we were going to cry, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be tears of sadness. It would be tears of joy. I'm blessed. I wake up every morning. I give God thanks. Uh, I ask him to give me the, the, the attitude, the gratitude, and service. He done brought me too far to turn around, so I already knew what this was going to be when I woke up this morning. I knew this was going to be when I took the job. It was just how, what path I was going to take and how he was going to take me. As long as I walked to the path, I was going to be all right. Uh, it feels amazing. Uh, just thinking that nobody thought that we would be right here, and we are. Like, y'all, through all the naysayers and anything, we kept our head up and stuff through. The last thing I got to say is the standard is the standard in Deville. Welcome to the City of Champions. Congratulations to everyone that was uh, acknowledged tonight. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. We will now go into closed session. We are back from closed session. We will continue with our agenda items. We will now move to take action on items from closed session. Madam Vice President, I recommend that the board approve the contract for our purchasing director. Is it purchasing director? As presented. Second. It has been motioned and second. All in favor? Raise your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. Is our new hire present? <laughs> All right. Good evening, Madam Vice President, um, Interim Superintendent, Mrs. Fields, and Board of Trustees. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome this evening Ms. Alicia Campbell. Ms. Campbell, if you will join me here at the podium. Is this on? You can hear me? Okay. Ms. Campbell brings over 18 years of experience to her new role as the Director of Purchasing for Duncanville ISD. She is a graduate of the University of Las Vegas and is also a certified Texas School Business Specialist. She has served as an account manager, a buyer for a neighboring school district, and most recently as the coordinator of purchasing in Carroll Independent School District. Ms. Campbell is driven and hardworking, um, and she is focused on excellence in processes and customer, services to, cu customer service to meet the needs of students. She is determined to use her knowledge, skills, and abilities to make a difference here in Duncanville ISD. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Campbell to the Duncanville ISD family. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so You're much. welcome. Thank you. 
Welcome, Ms. Campbell. Do I have a motion to approve the recommendation of the interim superintendent's contract recommendations as presented? Yes, Madam Vice President. I make a motion that the board moves to approve the recommendation of the interim superintendent as presented to offer the one-year term administrator contract to the listed professional staff members. It's been motioned and second. All in favor, please uh, show, raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the appoint, appointment of the listed recommendations as presented? Madam Vice President, I move that the board board approved the recommendation of the interim superintendent as presented to the second to offer the one year. Can, can I? Sorry. <laughs> I jumped on you. <laughs> it's okay. I was moving slow. Uh, to offer the one year term professional contract to the listed professional staff member. Second. It's been motioned and second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the appointment of the listed recommendation as presented? Madam Vice President, I move that the board approve the recommendation of the interim superintendent as presented to offer the one year non-certified contract to the listed professional staff members. Second. It's been motioned and second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. We do not have any communications from citizens. We will now move to consent agenda. Madam Vice President, I'd like to make a recommendation that we move item 8D and a item 8F to the consent agenda from the action agenda items. Second. Second. It's been motioned by Trustee Savage Martin, second by Trustee Fahey. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. Thank you. I'd also like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda items. Second. It's been motioned and second. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. We will now move on to the action item. We moved A. We will now move on to action item, uh, action agenda item A. Cancellation of the school board election for May 4th, 2024 to elect trustees for places six and seven. The presenter is Mr. Todd Garrison. Good evening, Madam Vice President, Dr. Ivory, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent, Mrs. Fields. I'm pleased to uh, announce that we have an opportunity for a cancellation of the board election as we have both places six and seven running unopposed again and remaining our board remaining intact. How much money does that save us? I would say uh, I, I, probably 10,000. I was gonna mention that. You're saving us money. It was a part of our cost saving plan. Uh, probably about ten thousand dollars, five to ten thousand. Just in case um, the community or anybody that will view this do not know the 
trustees that hold places six and seven. Will you guys lift, raise your hand or stand? Thank you so much. Do I have a motion to approve the order canceling the May 4th, 2024 School Board of Trustees election as presented? So moved. Second. It's been moved in second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. None opposed. Motion carries 6-0. We will now move to action item B, approval of bond manager, master, and work authorizations agreements. The presenter is Dr. Halashka. Good evening, Madam Vice President, Ms. Trustees, and Mrs. Fields. Last month, we introduced to you our selections for bond manager and architects to support our district with executing the voter-approved projects associated with our bond election. Each firm was selected following a comprehensive evaluation and interview process. Tonight, we're ready to move forward with finalizing our agreements with the bond manager, Lockwood, Andrews, and Newnham. The land team has been in consultation with the district for the past few weeks, determining the scope of their support and evaluating the needs of the district regarding bond management. The district is proposing we fully utilize the services offered by land to ensure we are maximizing the use of our dollars and the projects are ex executed with quality. The agreements provided this evening have been reviewed and negotiated by our attorneys with Thompson and Horton and include a master agreement and a work authorization agreement. Once the bond manager agreements are executed, then we will finalize project assignments and negotiate agreements with WRA and Huckabee. These are our selected architects. Therefore, the administration recommends that the board approve the 34-month master and work authorization agreements with Lockwood, Andrews, and Newnham, Inc. in the amount specified on page 8, section 2.1.1 of the work authorization agreement. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Do I have a motion to approve the master and work authorization agreements with Lockwood, Andrews, Newman Incorporated in the amount specified? So moved. Second. <laughs> it's been moved by Trustee Phillips, second by Trustee Savage Martin. All in favor, please uh, respond by raising your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Dr. Halashka. I think I'm still here. <laughs> we will now move to action item C, teacher incentive allotment funding plan. Continue, Dr. Halashka. Okay. Uh, good evening again, Madam Vice President, trustees, and Mrs. Fields. I am excited to share with you our plans to submit a grant application to the Texas Education Agency for participating in the Teacher Incentive Allotment Program. As part of the grant requirements, the Board of Trustees is required to adopt the spending plan portion of the overall local designation system plan. This evening, we will provide a general overview of our plan with a focus placed on the spending plan. You have a one-pager at your place this evening that outlines our spending plan. The overall comprehensive plan is available on our district website for public viewing. So let's start with a general understanding of the Teacher Incentive Allotment Program. The Teacher Incentive Allotment, or TIA, was passed during the 86th legislative session as a part of House Bill 3. As a means for providing additional funding to recruit and retain effective teachers in the classroom, specifically the focus was on teachers who serve in high need areas and rural school districts. The teacher incentive allotment is not intended to be a program that compensates all teachers and will not replace our current com compensation plan. It will focus on teachers who are in high need areas and who meet our district eligibility requirements. 
When considering whether or not our district should apply to participate in the TIA program, we first considered our purpose and our goals. Per our strategic plan, we know that recruiting and retaining high quality teachers is a need and a target for our district. In addition, we want to continue to provide additional compensation opportunities for our high performing teachers. The TIA program supports us with all three of these goals and allows us to ensure we have champions in the classroom. Our district is eligible to apply for Cohort G in the TIA program, so I'll walk you through the state timeline for this cohort. The grant application is due this April, uh, April 15th to be exact, and if accepted, we will spend next year capturing data. Our data will then need to be calibrated by the state in order to receive system approval. During this year, we will also be creating and delivering training to prepare teachers and leaders for the TIA program. Our initial group of teachers will be able to earn designations during the 25-26 school year. Once approved, training will be an ongoing part of the TIA process and will include required annual compliance training, embedded coaching, and T-TES and growth measure professional development and resources. T-TES is our evaluation system. So before I turn, over the pre turn the presentation over to Dr. Jordan, I want you to be aware of the steps the district has taken to ensure teachers have had a voice in the process and an opportunity to engage in the pre-planning work. We started in December with a teacher and leader survey that allowed us to get an in initial look at the interest of our teachers. We did have a majority of the respondents show support for us to engage in this effort, which, which fostered the development of the planning committee. Our district's planning committee consisting of 30, consisted of 30 members. 60% of these members are current Duncanville ISD classroom teachers and represent all levels and programs. Their names are listed on the district's TIA website. This committee has met three times to develop and refine our local designation system. These members will continue to serve for the next two years to provide guidance to district leadership in the development and refinement of our plan. In addition to the planning committee, we conducted focus groups at each campus and over 85 teachers participated in the feedback uh, opportunity. The feedback was collected and reviewed by our planning committee. We have also engaged in administrator training. We've trained principals, assistant principals, and district leaders to ensure they understood the proposed plan and had an opportunity to ask questions and give feedback. The administrators then shared the comprehensive plan with their campuses the week prior to spring break with an opportunity to provide additional feedback via our online feedback form, which again is on the district website. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jordan to dive further into our local designation system. Good evening. So Dr. Halachka has provided you with an overview. I just want to dig a little deeper into what teacher incentive allotment will look like for us in Duncanville. So there's two pathways for a teacher to earn a designation. The first pathway is through the local designation system. I will share a little bit of information with you about that. Um, a teacher will be identified as recognized, exemplary, or master. Um, and then the second way for them to earn a pathway could be a national board certification. Mm -hmm. So if in our multi-year rollout plan, they do not have the opportunity that first or second year, they could go through the national uh, board certification. So there's a way for teachers to be designated pretty quickly. So who's eligible for teacher incentive allotment? This is a hot ticket question uh, that most want to know. For us, it is full-time teachers with a valid standard Texas teacher certification for the content areas that we are rolling out. They must be the teacher of record um, in our system. So that's our Skyward system where we house our teacher data information for at least 90 days for 100% of the day. So for us, most of our teachers are full-time teachers, um, but they have to be the teacher of record for 90 days. 
and they must teach 50% of the day in academic courses. So we have some teachers in an eight period day who may teach only two academic courses and the remainder of their courses might be PE or athletics. So they would not be eligible for teacher incentive allotment. So Dr. Halachka started to talk about TTES, that is our evaluation system, the Texas Teacher Evaluation System of Support. So to earn that designation, 70% of their designation sc score will come from student growth. For us, that is using our MAP data. MAP is our universal screener. It is um, normed nationwide. It accounts for students' gaps and deficits, and it's adaptive. So it's based on where you are. So 70% of their score will come from MAP. And then the other 30% of their score will come from teacher observations for us T-tests, um, specifically looking at three domains. We're looking at domain two, which is instruction. Our goal is to ensure that our students grow, so we want to focus on instruction. And then domain three, which is the learning environment. Um, that's for most of us, classroom management and student engagement. And then we're also looking at domain four, professional practices and responsibilities. What are the teachers doing to build their own capacity? So again, 70% from their MAP scores, and then 30 30% from their teacher um, T-test evaluation. Every teacher will have one 45-minute observation at least, and then three 15-minute walkthroughs. And for us as a district, we will calibrate this process. So it's not what we're already doing. We will be working through a standardized calibration. Every T-test evaluator that you approve will go through this calibration process before they are allowed to evaluate the teachers in this model. So we have a phase-in plan. One thing that is very important to us is Duncanville is really focusing in on quality, not necessarily quantity. And so this plan will take us multiple years to roll out. So 23-24 is really our application year. 24-25, we are starting our data collection year, and we will move into having our K through eight reading and math teachers, as well as our K through six bilingual reading and math teachers. English one and two and algebra one teachers start to become eligible for the teacher incentive allotment. And then as you can see uh, in front of you, phase two, phase three, phase four, and phase five, we're rolling in another set of teachers. What I want to point out, which is very important, NWEA map data is normed. So it's a way for us to be able to account for growth um, in a very equitable way. As we move into some of the other subject areas where we don't have a MAP assessment, the district will have to develop an assessment and get approval by the state. So we're having some of those content areas like social studies or CTE later to give us time to develop those assessments and have them approved so that we can make sure that everything's aligned for all of our students. I am now going to turn it over to Kathleen Brown and she's going to share our funding plan with you. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. So this has been the hottest topic of all, the money piece. And so uh, we'll be taking a look at the funding plan. Um, so it's important for us to start with the fact that um, the funding for this plan, of course, flows from the state um, to the district. Um, and like Dr. Jordan mentioned, teachers can be designated in three areas. They can be recognized, they can be exemplary, or they can be a master um, teacher. Um, but the state has guidelines on how those funds are to be spent. And so uh, part of the statute is that 90% of the funds generated um, by a designated teacher has to be spent on compensation for the teachers at that campus. And so we cannot get all the money and put it in one pot at the district level and then disperse it. It is spent at the campus where that designated teacher um, is teaching. Um, the district is also um, not allowed to spend more than 10% of the teacher incentive allotment funds um, at the district level. And those funds can be used to support rollout, professional development, other initiatives um, as it relates to the teacher incentive allotment. So the teacher incentive allotment, Dr. Halachka mentioned, it's not a merit pay system. And so we are continuing to talk to our staff about that to make sure that they have a good understanding that it will not replace our current pay structure. Um, and teachers who receive funds from the teacher incentive allotment are going to receive those funds in the form of stipends. And those stipends will be TRS eligible. Um, and so um, how much funding is received? That is based on um, the campus socioeconomic need um, and it varies by district. 
So what that looks like at one district and campus may look very different in our district and campus. And so it's not comparing apples to apples. It is definitely apples to oranges as we speak with others in other districts. So it's important that when we're looking at this, we're looking at Duncanville and Duncanville ISD um, on its own. Um, so you can see the bands of pay here on the slide. Duncanville ISD designation averages would range between $5,725 up to $21,082. But it's important that we note that that is recalculated every year um, based on the measures that the state has in place. All right. So when we look at our funding plan as a district, um, and we're going to specifically focus on phase one this evening, um, in phase one, our teachers who earn a designation will receive 70% of the funds allotted, and all other certified teachers in good standing um, who meet that minimum requirement. And for us, that's a campus-based full-time teacher um, or librarian um, that has a um, valid um, standard certification, and they have an evaluation that is proficient or higher. And so the state requires that we have a measure in place. And so 70% of the funds would go to that designated teacher, the one who earned the designation. 20% would go to non-eligible teachers on that campus. And then the other 10% is for program support um, at the district level. Um, you have a handout um, in, in front of you with the spending plan. Um, and I'd have you to note um, that through the various phases, um, the, you will notice that the allotment to designated teachers continues to go up over the various phases, um, and there is a reduction in the allotment that non-eligible teachers or librarians are able to receive. Um, the reason for that is because through each phase, additional teachers become eligible to, um, to reach a designation, and so that's why you will see that increase and you will see the decrease um, in the allotment that's spread out. Um, the allotment at the district level, however, will stay remain the same at 10% and that's the maximum amount that we're able to keep at the district level. So um, how will these funds be spent? Um, what that will look like? When will payments be received? Um, the payments in our district, our, our main goals are recruitment and retention. And so when we look at our funding plan for districts, it's important that our plan matches what our needs are as a district. So for us, that's the recruitment and retention of quality. Um, and so we believe that um, the timeline that is outlined here aligns with that. There will be two payments spread over two checks in the summer. Um, to, to uh, support us retaining those champion teachers. And so the district will receive funds in April. Um, in May, um, that end of the year growth um, data would be calculated and the first payment um, to those individuals would be in June and it would be 30%. That is a point that we talked a lot about as a committee and received feedback on. Um, and the reason for that is, is because this is a retention tool. And so we want individuals to receive that first payment, but also to stick and stay um, with the district where they've received that designation. So the second payment would be in August. We're already back in school. Um, and it would be the majority Majority of the funding, 70%. And so that is definitely strategic and a part of, of our plan. Um, and the deadline for us to um, spend all of those funds is August 31st. Um, and so one, it's to support those the retention of quality teachers. Um, the standard state and federal deductions will, will apply, but they're also TRS um, eligible as it relates to their salary calculations. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was just saying that's great. <laughs> okay, yes, ma'am. Um, it's also, um, important for us to note um, when these designations are going to be earned. So we're looking at our winter class roster submission. Um, and that is how teachers, if you're not here during that time, then you're not eligible to receive a designation. Um, and then if teachers move, um, we've had lots of conversation about that. And that is also outlined on the, on the document that you have. If a teacher leaves the district, what happens, right? Um, if a teacher is promoted in the district and they are a designated teacher, what happens? So we want to be very specific and very clear um, about what happens with funding as it relates to designated teachers. Um, earlier, Dr. Jordan talked to you about those national board certified teachers as well. Our national board certified teachers for our, for our district will be treated as our recognized teachers. And so the funding plan, everything is the same. It will be in the category of those who are recognized. Um, and so with that information, um, we do want you to know that the board will approve the expenditure of TIA form, uh, funds every year as a point, a part of the budget process. We'd be bringing that to you. And so uh, we are recommending that the board approve the district's teacher instead of allotment funding plan on this evening. Um, and it would be our pleasure to answer any questions you all have at this time.
Or do we have any questions? No questions. Okay, thank you. Thank all three of you. Do I have a motion to approve the teacher incentive allotment funding plan following state requirements? So moved. Second. It's been motioned by Trustee Savage Martin, second by Trustee Colton. Are there any questions, comments, or discussions? We answered that already. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 6 0. We will now move to action item E, request for a proposal for Bird Middle School Roof. Presenter, Ms. Zamara. Good evening, Vice President Dr. Ivory, Ms. Field, Board of Trustees. So as recommended by the 2023 Bond Committee, replacement of roofs were a priority, and Bird Middle School is on the top of that priority list. Uh, Bird Middle School requires a full replacement, and the goal is to have it completed this summer. Uh, the district therefore solicited proposals to obtain vendors. The request for proposal 2324.005 Bird Middle School roof package was developed in conjunction with our roof consultant Armco Industries. The request for proposal RFP was released February 5th, 2024. A pre-bid meeting was held February 14th, 2024 to go over the specs and the details of the replacement as well as do an on-site visit on the bird roof itself. Um, 12 vendors attended this meeting. The completed RFP responses were provided, uh, received, excuse me, prior to the closing at 10 a.m. on February 26, and we received eight completed responses. The responses were then evaluated and ranked based on cost of project, bidders, qualifications, bidders' reputation with the district, and the industry, bidders experience and best suited to meet the district needs. As highlighted in the RFP bid tab total, which is on page 107, Triland Roofing and Waterproofing Inc.'s proposal was ranked highest. Um, in addition, handed to you is the agreement from our roofing consultant, Armco Industries. Duncan Malaysia has successfully used Armco for over 20 years. Uh, the agreement covers the entire process from evaluation, drawings, bid support, and construction observations. The agreement is for 7% of the roofing construction contract. Bird Middle School roof replacement project will be funded with bond reimbursement funds. Therefore, tonight we're recommending the board approve Trilam Roofing and Waterproofing Inc. for the full replacement of Bird Middle School roof at a cost of $2,679,000. That includes $175,000 in general contingency funds. We also recommend the approval of Arco Industries roofing consultant agreement for 7% of the roofing construction contract, which totals $187,530. Please let me know if there's any questions that Mr. Joe Paterka, Director of Maintenance, uh, can answer for us. Also, Javier Flores from Arco is here as well to answer any questions. The last two amounts that you mentioned, are they included in the 2,679,000? No, so the second the second amount, so let me go back. So the 2,679,000, that does include the contingency funds of 175,000, yes. The Armco contract is separate. So that one's $187,530 which is 7% of the 2.6 million. So we have before us a motion for Trilam roofing for the board middle, uh, Bird Middle School roof. Do I have a motion to approve the award RFSCP 2324.005 to try lamb roofing and waterproofing incorporated at the cost of $2,679,000. Uh, I have one question first, and you may have said, but this is part of the bond. She said, uh -huh. Yes, okay. it is. Huh? Thank you. Then it is so moved. Second. It has been motioned and second. 
by Trustee Savage Martin and Trustee Vera Cruz. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 6 0. We will now move to action item F Instructional Materials Proclamation 2024 Science Textbook Adoption. The presenter is Dr. Jordan. Sorry, we're going to G. Thank you, team. It's okay. Still, Dr. Jordan. Madam Vice President, Trustees, Interim Superintendent, Mrs. Fields, I am excited to bring to you a partnership with Dallas County for 4-H opportunities for our students. So a partnership with Dallas County 4-H program is for our students who are ages 5 through 18. Everything will be funded by Dallas County and Texas A&M, and all curriculum will be provided by 4-H. So we are focusing in on three new programs, or three programs, they're not all new, that will be coming to us. It's the Better Livings for Texans that will provide nutrition education to our parents, our families, but it also will bring opportunities for gardens, raised bed gardens at Smith Elementary. Um, then we have the Eggs to Chick program that our students used or had last year where they get to watch those little cute eggs hatch into chicks. Um, and then we have a new program that I'm going to share with you, which is Teens as Teachers. So again, this partnership provides several extracurricular activities, not only for our students, but for our families and the communities. So our Teens as Teachers grant is a new opportunity for us. We are the first district who will be able to pilot this grant. And what this grant provides Duncanville ISD is an opportunity for one student. Um, again, it's a pilot. They're trying to see how well it will go and then we will grow it. But one student at Duncanville High School will be able to apply to actually be a facilitator teacher for camp this summer. Um, the selected individual will go through an interview process. They will go through training as if they are an educator. Um, and then they will be focusing in on four programs, teaching our youngest students through gardening, STEM, mental health, and then soccer for success. It's a two-year grant. And so the student selected will get to be the teacher for this year and for next year. Um, if approved tonight, we will begin the application process at Duncanville High School. Um, the student that's selected will not, not only receive a membership through 4-H, but they will be eligible for scholarships for post-secondary. A part of this grant requires us to have um, adjunct staff members. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time with you explaining what that is for Duncanville. Um, in order for the student to be selected, he or she will have to go off campus for some off-site training um, in order for us to receive or count the student present um, here in Duncanville and receive funding, they can be under the supervision of an adjunct staff member. So the adjunct staff member has to have a bachelor's degree. They have to participate in TRS. They have to remain an employee through Texas A&M. Um, they will receive no compensation, salary, benefits, anything from Duncanville ISD, and they shall direct all of the acti activities when the student is in their presence. But again, it keeps us protected for attendance wise and gives us funding and also allows for the student to go off site and receive the training, especially success for soccer, uh, gardening, going to their facilities. And so a part of the grant is we're asking approval for that list that was provided to you of the adjunct staff members to be considered adjunct um, and the students selected to be able to go off site with those individuals. So that's quick, I apologize, but the recommendation is for us to approve the resolution to be sanctioned as an extracurricular activity for the ex to chick, the better living and the teens. Teach, teens as Teachers Program and to approve the adjunct faculty agreement between Duncanville ISD and 4-H Dallas County. Thank you. Any questions? Trustee Fahey. This sounds like a wonderful program. I think we've needed something like this for a long time. Um, is Smith the only elementary campus to participate and is it because they already have their little butterfly garden or is that the reason why they're the only ones? So they're not the only ones to participate. Okay. It is because they are the environmental science campus, but uh -huh. we will have the opportunity for other campuses to participate as okay. well. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Trustee Phillips. Thank you, Madam Vice President. 
Um, Dr. Jordan, how was Duncanville selected to participate in the pilot program? So Pam Brant or Pam Thomas, our director of advanced academics, has a partnership through Dallas County. And so we've been actively seeking out funding sources to give our students some experiences. So she went to a community meeting and met with them and applied as an interested entity. And so of the, I believe, 27 districts, Duncanville was the only district selected. Pamela Thomas. Thomas. Okay. Was she our former collegiate principal? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. I have a question. Yes. Do the students, uh, for the teens to teachers, do they have to be part of Taffy? They do not have to be a part of Taffy. Um, what Pamela Thomas and I discussed is they would have first priority, but it's also open to who has availability this summer to teach the camps. And so we will okay. open it up to them first and then offer it to others. Any additional questions? Comments? I'm super excited about this. Thank you for this. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the resolution for the 4-H organization to be sanctioned as an extracurricular activity and the approval of the adjunct faculty agreement between Duncanville ISD and 4-H Dallas County? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second by Trustee Colton. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motions carry 6 0. Thank you. Oh, you can say. Yes, I believe I have the next couple of items. We will now move to action item H consider approval of 2024 25 academic calendar. Continue, Dr. Jordan. Madam Vice President, I am honored to share with you all the recommendation for the 24 25 academic calendar. Um, one of the first priorities is to make sure that our calendar has 75,600 minutes, which really equates to 168 instructional days. In the past several years, we've had many more days built into our calendar, and so the committee wanted to continue with that tradition. We also wanted to have at least three teacher work days um, embedded into the calendar and to make sure that our teachers had a 187-day work calendar to align with their contracts. The committee met and some of their some of their priorities were to have professional development or work day after winter break. This year we started the teachers came back the same day as the students. They also requested to have spring break aligned with Dallas College and that is very significant for us for a couple of reasons. One, when we are not aligned with Dallas College, we have to find a place for our students and yes. or um, students are needing to be transported and we're not in school. Yeah. The second part is based on our outcomes-based measures, or we call it OBM. Our students have to be supervised when they are at Dallas College. So if the principal and assistant principal are not on contract, they're off for spring break, they would need to come in to accompany our students over to Dallas College. Mm -hmm. And so it is imperative for us to make sure that we take care of our students, the youngest to the oldest, that we have our spring breaks aligned. So you'll notice that the calendar presented has spring break a little later, but that's just to make sure that we are aligned with Dallas College. Um, and I believe our surrounding districts are all doing the same. Um, and then to continue with fall break, and we loved having PD days embedded throughout the year for our teachers. So again, those were our priorities. You have in front of you calendar options A, B, and C. Um, some of the bigger differences is the first day of school. One has a Monday start, calendar B has a Wednesday start, and then C has a um, Tuesday start. All of the calendars have us ending before Memorial Day. Some of the calendars have a shorter fall break just so that we can embed in everything that was a priority. Um, at least 16 or 15 days of professional development is embedded into each calendar and they all exceed our minimum minutes of instruction. So I'll briefly just highlights of A, B, and C. So A, there's a one week fall break. Spring break is not the same as Dallas College. It does include five professional development days and then the semester days for students and teachers are there for you. Calendar option B, there's only three days for fall break. Again, that's all based on just building in professional development throughout the year. Um, and so we had to shorten fall break. We also have spring break the same as Dallas College and there are six PD days embedded throughout the year. 
And then calendar option C has a one week for fall break. It has bad weather days included, just in case we have more ice or snow. And then it has six professional development days throughout the year. So we administered a survey. His feedback is very important. We have the survey. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Did C align with Dallas College? I didn't hear you mention that. Yes, C did align. C does. Yes. Okay. Spring break. So we administered a survey to get um, stakeholder feedback. The survey was open for two weeks in English and in Spanish. It went to four groups of stakeholders, and this year we had 1,681 responses. And so the first, um, how are you a member of the Duncanville ISD family? So 38% staff members, 20% students, almost 40% are parents or, parents or guardians, and then 2.3% community members. So as you can see, the majority of our feedback came from our parents. And then um, we had them select a calendar that best met their needs, and we thought best they thought best met the academic needs of Duncanville and calendar C with 51% was the calendar that was selected. So it is my recommendation that the board adopts calendar C as the 24-25 academic calendar. Any questions? Trustee Fahey? Yes, how can I tell on the second um, graph how many of the 51.3% who want option C are students, are teachers, are parents? On the second graph, uh -huh. it's for, oh, I don't have that on the graph for you, but I can and, get it for you. See, I think that's real important because I understand that it has the majority, but I'd like to know who those people are. Yes, I can get a breakdown for you. I can tell you that it was a good mix of parents, students and teachers that voted for calendar C, a healthy, like a almost an equal split. But can I can get the breakdown the, for you. Can you tell me the majority of what the teachers wanted? I can. So the teachers were split. The majority of the teachers still voted for calendar option C. Their next calendar option that they picked as teachers was A. But still the majority of them voted for C. And then what about parents? It was the same. The parents okay, then I can C. figure out students after that okay. yes all right thank you thank you trustee colton thank you very much i uh, have a question regarding the uh, total number of instructional minutes for calendar c calendar c is less than the uh, calendar a and b options it appears by one day Yes. So can you speak to that? I can. So calendar option C has fewer instructional days for a couple of different reasons. One, we have a Tuesday start, so we're not starting at the beginning of the week. We also have a one-week fall break, so that would shorten us, versus I believe calendar option B has three days fall break, so that's where you gain a day. And then calendar option C has a few more professional development days embedded in the calendar. So what we did with only having two extra days is we embedded in bad weather days. So technically with the two bad weather days and the two extra days, we have four days built into our calendar. So I just have a question regarding the benefit of that extra 450 mm -hmm. minutes. Can you speak to that? I can. Something that we talked about with the committee is really prioritizing. So three years ago, we had a 180-day student calendar because our students were coming back from COVID, and we wanted to make sure that we were working really hard to close the learning gap. What we've recently discovered is with our teaching force, how it is, um, we have certified teachers, non-certified teachers. Really, our priority is building the capacity in the adults. Um, so even if we have students here for 180 days, if quality tier one instruction is not what it needs to be, then students are not receiving what they need. So this year, we really wanted to focus in on building the capacity of the teachers so that when the students are in the seat, they are receiving the best instruction possible. So as we started to look at our calendars and started to think about our needs, our highest priority was professional learning for the adults. 
So what would it do to our calendar if um, they started with, with calendar C started on Monday as opposed to Tuesday? It would give us one extra day. So we would go up to 171. So we would have three days um, built into our calendar plus the two bad weather days. And then we would need to, because we're adding a day, that's it. Because the teacher's are already working that Monday. So it just give us one extra day built into our calendar. So our Monday's calendar. calendar C has two bad weather days and the other options have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you speak to that? I can. So when you look at calendar option B, it has one bad weather day built in. And so it's where you see a red is where we would have a bad weather day. So any of those can become bad weather days um, for us. But for calendar option B, we already had four days built in to the calendar, so we wouldn't ne necessarily need to bring students in on a holiday. Um, whereas we didn't have as many built in to see, so we might need to remove a holiday. And then also in calendar option C, well, bring them in on a holiday, so not remove it, but they might have to come to school on a holiday. But calendar option C, if you notice, February 14th is not a holiday. It is a day where students are out but if we need them to make it up, they can come in without really inconveniencing the community and parents by them missing Good Friday or missing Thanksgiving or missing something that is a holiday and significant in their family. So C allowed us the opportunity to collect a day back because we're giving them a day that's not a national holiday. So my question, am I correct in that calendar C, the students start on Tuesday, but the teachers are there on Monday? Yes. So if we start at school on Monday, that takes a teacher workday away from them. Is that correct? That is correct. The teachers okay. would lose one workday or PD day. Any additional questions? Do I have a motion to approve calendar C, as presented for the 2024-25 academic school year. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Fahey, second by Trustee Bear Cruz. Are there any questions, comments, or more discussion? Trustee uh, Colton. I have a comment uh, for, um, you know, I in the future, if we could reconsider the uh, total number of instructional minutes and um, the priority to provide time for professional development as well because, um, you know, our district needs, our students need, you know, as much time in the classroom as possible. And while, you know, I uh, am probably going to approve this item, I just don't want to, you know, go on record as approving a calendar that provides for less time in the classroom for the students, you know, overall. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. We will now move to information and discussion items. The first item is, did we move that too? <laughs> okay, the first item, I wanted to say thank you to Trustee Colton. I appreciate the, the focus on instructional minutes. I do understand that our district is trying to find ways to support our teachers because our focus is retention and and recruiting, and, and it's, a, it's a hard balance, but I do appreciate the academic uh, instructional time focus. Dr. Jordan. Madam Vice President, trustees, Mrs. Fields, 
I would like to share with you um, Proclamation 2024 as it relates to our career and technical education. So thank you for approving the science textbook adoption earlier. This is the same process that we went through for science. We are now reviewing for our CTE courses. And so Proclamation 2024 happens when we need to call for new instructional materials. And so some of our CTE courses, specifically our STEM classes, science, technology, engineering, and math, our education and training, our health science, and our technology apps courses are up for textbook adoption. And so we convened a committee, a team, that consisted of 21 individuals. And as you will see on the screen, it's 21 staff members. And it's staff members because our resources are open for the public. So parents, community, family members can come up as well. Um, the 21 staff members had the opportunity to review all of the publishers that were approved by the state. Um, we had all of the resources and materials open at the Teaching and Learning Center for the community public to view. And then we will finalize at the end of this month, a recommendation of which publisher or publishers we would like to go with, and I will bring it back to you next month. There's some non-negotiables for us, specifically for CTE. It has to align with all of our CTE classes. So we'll have a publisher that says, we can meet everything for STEM, health science, technology apps, but we may not, so we may have to split. Um, and it's important for us to adopt someone who gives our students connection and exposure, even from software programs. And so that is a priority for us, and we will use a rubric um, as we begin to review. We have four publishers that have been approved and four publishers that will be presenting to the team, GW Publisher, ICEV, Savis, which you saw in our science as well, and then eDynamic Learning. So all four are currently uh, presenting to the team, and then we'll be setting up the resources for us to view at the Teaching and Learning Center. So here's the timeline for you. Very similar to science, we're just one month behind. And so I will be bringing to you next month a recommendation from the team to adopt a set of materials or a couple of sets of materials, depending on our needs. That concludes my presentation for you. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Any questions? I have one. Yes. Is part of the non-negotiable, is it consumables versus online access and supplementals for our students? Is that a high priority for it, us? It is a high priority um, and it's cost related as well. So making sure our students have access to it when they're not in class. Yes. Um, and then making sure for this eight year adoption that as a district we are not responsible financially for resources um, that was not included in the adoption. Yes. That is a part of our rubric that we will use. That's great. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. You. Jordan. We will move to the information discussion agenda item B, Gen Z program with Ms. Pamela Brown. Good evening, Madam Vice President, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent, Mrs. Fields. I will be presenting the Advising Generation Z Memorandum of Understanding uh, to you today. What is Advising Gen Z? Gen Z, or Generation Z, is a curriculum that addresses specific student infractions and creates an effective restorative tool for student behavior management and achievement. This partnership would provide campuses with ready-made restorative consequences that could potentially support in-school in suspension or uh, ISS classrooms, um, solidifying ISS as an essential part of Duncanville's overall behavior management program. It is currently used by several surrounding districts, as you can see in the slide, in addition to local county court systems uh, to so assign interventions to you. Currently, there is no curriculum for students in in-school suspension, in -school suspension or ISS. Gen Z offers a learning platform that includes lessons, diversion videos, and facilitation guides to help students address their behavior, learn from their mistakes, and focus on college or career readiness. 
After students in ISS finish the work assigned by their classroom teachers, they can use Gen Z as a platform to help meet behavioral goals and expectations. We plan to pilot this at the middle school IS, uh, S classrooms and the two alternative campuses. Gen Z is a confidential program and they are FERPA compliant. Um, there are parental permission slips embedded within the program where the parents would have to give permission for their students to participate uh, with the online learning platform. Students are given uh, different unique ID numbers to mask their identity. So uh, they, we would know who the students are, but Gen Z would not. The program is free to Duncanville ISD for one year. We are only responsible for providing general discipline information uh, and demographic data about the, le about the learning platform. Continued funding is based upon our use and data. And so there is the opportunity that we could uh, get this free in the future. Training will take place this summer for pilot campuses and meetings would be held throughout the year to monitor the progress and usage of the platform. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Currently, do we have any classrooms in elementary or intermediate for ISS? Uh, intermediate campuses do have, have ISS. Elementary. Have we thought of any for elementary? Our elementary campuses do not have, currently have ISS classrooms. Uh, some may they may have something they call, but it's not official ISS, okay. a makeshift ISS, so to speak, but not officially, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But we do have elementary students that go to Summit. Yes. And so uh, they would use it at Summit if we have elementary age students at Summit, correct? Yes, correct. That is correct. All grades, PK, K? Well, we're piling it just at the middle school campuses. Um, I know, but Hudson, Summit. Um, Oh, well, yes. Uh, well, it has to be certain criteria. It's very rare that a pre-K or a kinder student, um, there are age limits and offenses, but for students that are assigned to Summit, um, they, they could use the platform. Additional questions? Trustee Colton? Dr. Brown, there's currently no, no type of instruction um, in discipline, for lack of a better term, at Summit and the other? No, Summit has certified teachers and they're receiving instruction. Uh, this would just be an additional tool um, for students that are assigned to Summit for various behavioral you know, offenses to hopefully help them make wiser de decisions in the future. But no, Summit has certified teachers, they're receiving instruction. This would just be an additional tool. Well, yes, so they're receiving instruction based upon the classwork, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But this is adding something new. Yes, this would be addition to focus on the behavior. Yes. Yes. And, and it's something that does not currently exist. Currently. Yes. Uh, we have a program called Safe Schools, um, but this is different. This is, um, those are more like online modules, this is a different platform um, that would kind of be targeted toward those students and it would be more specific. Um, so no, we do not currently have anything like Generation C. Okay, and then what is the track record? Um, so there was positive feedback. Ms. Hudson, our Director of Restorative Practices and Student Management, um, she reached out to several of the districts that currently use this and they, they loved it. Um, they had no complaints. Um, I know she spoke with someone in Crowley. They really gave kudos. They highly recommended the program, especially uh, with it being at no cost. I think it's grant funded. Um, and so um, pretty much if the, like, if the district has good usage and platform, we may have the opportunity to use it again, as with some of the other districts for free. But um, she received positive reviews, so she did reference check with several other districts. So they monitor change behavior? I don't know that they monitor change behavior, but I know that they provide the modules, the lessons, the, div the diversion videos, um, even some things where parents can participate. They even have uh, 
I don't want to call them webinars. <laughs> there are live sessions uh, where even parents and students can attend them in the evenings together. So it's to curtail the behavior, um, but they will collect some data at the end. Um, Ms. Hudson may better may be, you can ask, yeah. She can ask, uh, better answer the question about how mm -hmm. they will monitor the data. Next slide. <laughs> Hello, good evening. So there are set times, uh, four different times throughout the school year that all school districts and county officials get together and meet. And we talk about the impact that this program has. Um, and so this is the first year that Crowley ISD, DeSoto ISD, those school districts that you saw, this was the first year that it went into school districts, but it's been in the county court system prior to that. And so, yes, we are monitoring and tracking through those cohorts that we have four times a year. Well, I, I appreciate, you know, you. you all bringing this program, you know, to try and help the students that need help in this area. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh -huh. um, since it's free the first year, I have to. I'm wondering why wouldn't we introduce it at the high school? Can anybody answer that? Yes, ma'am. The reason why we wanted to pilot it at the middle school, I we, as you well know, Dr. Ivory, the high school is massive. And so I do want to truly ensure the fidelity of this program being implemented in the district before we expand it to somewhere as great as Duncanville High School. And so that's why we chose the middle schools to start in their ISS. But currently the high school has nothing. And it seems like even if this data would, even though it's a, even though we're piloting and we don't have a consistent track record, th this would be better than doing a whole nother school year with nothing at the high school. There, There's nothing. And so I'm wondering if, uh, Ms. Fields, if we could revisit not having that at the high school. That is something that we could discuss and revisit. Yes, ma'am. But you wouldn't want to set up the program for failure. Um, so I will address as well that because we are piloting at the summit also. So those students who have access to the program at the summit, they don't lose access once they go back to DHS. Once you have access, you have access. So that's one population of students, but I do understand your concern and that is definitely something that we can consider, Dr. Ivory. I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Savage Martin. Sorry. Well, I just thought, you know, her thought of not presenting it to the high school because there are so many students there, you could be setting the program up for failure possibly too they might look at the numbers and want to charge us <laughs> well if the first year is free the first year is free well and i i'm just coming from there's absolutely no curriculum at the high school currently when students go there it's so subjective what they do if teachers send work at all and to have something in place is better than not yes ma'am thank you for that, that. That was just my, and then my second question is, do we have a set of measurements? What do we want to measure um, rolling this out the first year? What are we going to look for? Can, can our staff create, this is what we will bring to the board after a year and not just, we don't have any complaints, it's good, but if we know ahead of time what it is that we want to measure and then we look for that. Yes, ma'am, there are some data points that I'm already mm -hmm. putting in place for that and we will definitely, we don't ever wanna present anything to you all that we cannot come back and say, this is the benefit and the impact that this program has had on this, the students in our district. Thank you, because it didn't sound like the, the other district that talked to you really spoke about data points, so I'm just wondering if we know ahead of time, not we the board, we we're, the district, we're, what we're looking for. I was going to say, we're currently in the process. We were actually talking about developing a two today to talk about how do we determine if the behavior has changed other than the number of referrals. So we were actually having that, pro that discussion today, and that is in development. Yeah. And I'll also let you know, because we have not yet been uh, – this MOU has not yet been in place. I have not been privy to those meetings that do discuss the actual data. So as soon as that happens, I'll be privy to those data points. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, Any additional questions? Trustee Fahey? Yes. Um, I just forgot. Um, 
we don't currently have an ISS curriculum. So what we're doing now, just using this, the teachers, the work pages or whatever, would the new ISS curriculum replace the teacher assignment or no. be an addition no. to this, it? This will be completed after they finish their classroom assignment. So they'll still okay. be required to complete their assignments. This is just an addition to. And then if we should approve this later, it would be added to our code of conduct? Would it become part of that in some form or fashion? It would not become part of our code of conduct, but we do have a list of like restorative tools. Uh, we have like a, a discipline matrix, you know, consequences where we yes. kind of recommend various options and it would be put into that document as another tool for a restorative discipline. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. We will move to information discussion, agenda C, budget update. Mr. Garrison, we're almost done. We're almost there. Good evening again, Madam Vice President, Board of Trustees and Mrs. Fields. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to provide the budget uh, planning update for this month. Uh, this is a slide you're all familiar with or we're all familiar with and um, I won't go through slide by slide but if you'll go to the middle row I would say we're hovering between those last three and really progressing towards the the fourth there uh, we have not set the enrollment projections or set uh, the staffing projections based on enrollment but we're refining those we've looked at those uh, and are looking at those in more detail we actually have meetings this week uh, to further make sure that our projections are as good as they can be and uh, also prior prioritizing the budget assumptions and functions um, we've received back um, i think all but three of the campus budgets at this point I'm starting to get contact have meetings set up with uh, lots of questions from departments and and meetings set up so we're really making good progress in those areas i want to give an update on where we stand currently on our general fund revenues uh, as you can see, there are, are all of our revenue sources are listed there, are local, state, and federal, uh, and the percentages of the budget. So the budgeted amounts there, we budgeted a total of just over $127 million. Uh, we've collected roughly $90 million. That's about 70%. And so I feel good about that. We really need to hold strong. Um, one of the biggest factors uh, as far as meeting those projections will be maintaining our attendance rate, uh, especially later in the year. And that's always a challenge for every district as we get into the spring and summer or closer to summer. From there, um, I want to look at our uh, fund balance. It's a real positive for our financials for the district. So our fund balance at the end of uh, last fiscal year uh, was just over 64 million, uh, a reserve of 21. A reserve is set by the, the auditors. There's an amount that's set by them that is uh, designated as reserved. A committed fund balance, we need to maintain just, just uh, under 32 million, and that's three months operating. So we just take what our annual expenses are divided by 12, it comes up with an, a number. We're required to maintain a minimum of three months fund balance in there. So that's where we come up with the 11, uh, million dollars in our available fund balance or what we would call available spending fund balance I've included the ESSER funds even though that that's something that we don't typically and we don't approve at the board letter level for budget purposes but I think it's important because of the fact uh, the factor that it has on our uh, general fund um, budget so all the way back to ESSER 1 uh, a little over 4 million was um, designated in ESSER 1 funds those are those have been expended uh, ESSER 2, same, 11, uh, just under 12 million in ESSER 2. That was expended at the conclusion of this past year. Those had to be, uh, had the, the grant period closed as of uh, September of last year, just as ESSER 3 will close out at the September of this year. So ESSER uh, 3 started out about 25 million. Uh, we have a balance of 9.8 million. And of that is about 7.7 .7 million of our payroll sits in that fund. And those are funds that won't be available for uh, the coming year as we budget for 24-25. If I can, I'm gonna ask for a little bit of grace and I'm gonna skip this slide and come back to this because I think the flow will be better if we look at the uh, next two slides and come back to that. So on the next one, we'll talk a little bit about budget influences. 
and we're going to start under the legislative changes. And when I say changes, I use changes loosely because there weren't a lot of changes made. Um, a lot of promises made, not a lot of changes. Uh, there was consideration for funding on enrollment instead of ADA, did not change. Our basic allotment, uh, there, you know, as you know, the legislators are sitting on the largest fund balance they've ever had. No change in basic allotment and no change in salary increase, although uh, as a district and as a board, we've um, approved salary increases for our current year for uh, teachers and, and um, a number of staff members as well. Uh, they put the property, uh, the property value adjustments, they had the $100,000 homestead exemption that went in. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of a decline of enrollment and we do try to target at 92%, but anything less than that really affects our revenue stream coming down. And so going into next year, we already know that um, our, pro our projections at this time is that our enrollment will be lower in 24-25 than our current year. And so that will equate to less revenue. 100,000 homestead exemption will stay in place. Uh, I'll know more about the property value increase. We actually have a webinar next week uh, with that entity that'll give us um, a little bit of an idea of what we're gonna do. We'll get some preliminary values within the coming weeks, and then we'll get our certified estimated values at the end of April, April 25th. And so I'll have a better idea of that, but that's kind of my estimate right now where I think we'll, we'll end up with that. And then we'll have further tax rate uh, compression. So the trend is still not good because we're losing, we're showing a little bit of a decline in enrollment. Then you go down to uh, expenditures and we're seeing you know as you know as we all know both personally and professionally uh, massive inflation utilities and insurance in particular hit very hard for the district and those are big figures for us uh, as well as health in, uh, health insurance increases so those are things that are going to affect our budget for next year none of which is in a positive direction so you've seen this slide before as well but I've updated this with some more current numbers as we again I've talked about we were refining uh, our enrollment projections. And when we do that, we use the demographers report. We look at our current enrollment and then our student services and PEMS looks at uh, what we call our roll up or what we, what we anticipate who graduates and as we roll up the classes. And right now it's looking at um, on a projected funding enrollment of 11,385. So a loss of about 128 students uh, for the coming year. That equates to about a million dollars in loss in, in revenue for the district. That's, that's about what those come up with. So after looking at those, then we'll go back and look at our trends. And I think that'll help identify where these things are in our budget. So all the way back to 22, 23, you can see, and I wish if I had this to do over again, I would change the expenditures to red so you could distinguish because uh, you got the revenue and expenditures are pretty close to each other. And then you've got ESSER funds there so you had a pretty close to balanced budget, wasn't, wasn't far out. As you know, we've adopted a, you know, a rough, just over $5 million deficit budget for our current budget. Um, but that's being offset. One of, one of the things I wanna point out is it's being offset with ESSER. But the other thing is looking at the expenditures from 22 to 23 to 23, 24, is about a $10 million increase, $10 million increase in expenditures we are not getting a $10 million increase in our revenue, which is showing our budget deficit. So when you go into 24, 25, and you look at declining enrollment, um, no increase or anything from the state, you're gonna have, we're, we're, there's, there's no doubt that we'll operate with less revenue, but it's gonna be very difficult to not have increases. And so any, you know, we're, we're working at, uh, taken multiple steps. We've decreased campus budgets by 5%, department budgets by 10%. Uh, we're refining staffing ratios. We're doing some things, but it's going to take, that's, that's the gap we're going to have to close, as you see there, um, that budget deficit of what we're going to have to do. Because again, we don't have the ability to control our revenue. The only thing we can do is control our expenditures. And so that's, this is going to be the tall task and the tall order that we're going to work through. And this is not going to happen in the next four weeks or next three months. This is going to be a strategic uh, process, a group effort, a combined effort, and being very strategic about what we're looking at to do to get the budget balanced. Um, obviously, the $15 million is more than what we really have in our ex uh, expendable uh, fund balance. I'm not terribly concerned, but that's not a trend we can continue. We've got to move this down and start ticking this back the other direction so that we'll be in good shape. Um, especially with knowing this year we're 
um, not in a legislative session, and we're not going to see any relief. This is not something I would see. I don't anticipate any changes for our current year. I do think that, um, and I won't belabor the point, but I, we're not the only ones in this situation. It does, you know, uh, doesn't make the situation better, but we are. Um, there's a, there are other districts in this um, as well. And so I think going into a legislative session, there's gonna be a lot of pressure put on the state to help rectify some of these issues. And so with that, I'll go to our budget uh, deadlines. Uh, everything on the left that has a check mark are things that we've completed. Again, I've already received the majority of our campus budgets back, uh, making great progress on our department budgets. I've mentioned uh, that we're soon to receive our uh, preliminary estimated values. We'll be doing a budget workshop uh, that'll get more in detail on this uh, April 8th, um, through, I think that's three weeks from now. And then the following week, we'll have another update at the board, at our regular board meeting. By the end of that month, we'll have our regular, our certified estimated values in, and then that'll really heat up into our May meeting where we do more workshops and really refine our budget before we do our postings and notices. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Trustee Colton. Good evening, Dr. Brown. I have a question regarding the ESSER three funds. I believe okay, currently there is a balance of nine point basically eight million. Yes, and uh, 7.7 7 of that is allocated for payroll. Um, the gap between the two, is it allocated for something? It, it is somewhat allocated. It's something I've worked with Dr. Jordan. Should I, should I talk? So I don't want to speak. I don't get try to, I try to stay out of that academic side as much as I can, but there are ESSER requirements and I wasn't here when this was done. And so I try to be careful. And if you, if I need to be corrected, please, feel free to jump in. But there are requirements with ESSER that have to do with closing achievement gaps, professional development, and things of that nature. And there are some of those funds that have been earmarked for expenditures, uh, and that's the, that's the gap. And that's a, a, a great question, because that is the gap in that, and something we've communicated about, so that we've earmarked the payroll, and the other is required spending. Yes, ma'am. And what is the deadline for spending that money? Uh, the, the, get, the, Grant ends September 31st, but we have until December at the, of the next year to actually expend it. Everything has to be encumbered. We can't change it and do new things, but if it's something that we already have on the books, and again, payroll is not one of those things that will have to end, but if it's a program or something of that nature, then we will be able to expend that out at this time. Now, they may they're, it's not uncommon for them to provide updates as we get to the end of the year and they see schools are, have substantial amounts of money and they'll say, okay, well, we need to, uh, you can do a, a extended period of pay down, but they won't release new funds, uh, very unlikely let to amend our grant. Okay, but the payroll portion has to be expended by sep September? Yes, ma'am. Of this but year, right? Of this current year, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any additional questions? We will now move. To, there are no communications from citizens. Being that there are no further items to discuss, this meeting is adjourned.